EA Sports presents Pennzoil at the Half, sponsored by Pennzoil, specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our studios in New York. Greg Gumbel along with Clark Kellogg. Welcome to Pennzoil at the Half. At the Half, the Tennessee Volunteers making the most of their first showing the Sweet 16 ever, leading it by three. They really had North Carolina on the ropes. The quickness, the pressure had started to bother North Carolina, but then the Tar Heels finished with a nice rush. It's only a three-point game, anybody's ball game at this point, but I still think Tennessee's speed and their pressing defense could be a factor in the second half. The other game in action right now is taking place at the Carrier Dome in Syracuse and Seton Hall and Oklahoma State doing battle. The Cowboys lead at 43 to 45 and it's gone in the second half. Seton back to the action in Syracuse at the Carrier Dome. Seton Hall trailing Oklahoma State by three. Let's take it there live. Jim Nance and Billy Packer. Oklahoma State trying to score from the inside. The Cowboys, the three seed in the East, were down one at halftime. A basket disallowed at the buzzer at the end of the half. Uh, made just in court inside the midcourt stripe by Desmond Mason. And there's Mason missing again from long range. Good blocking out by Seton Hall on the inside. That's why they're doing such a good job of rebounding. Pocinus surprised Mason by taking him. Mason limping a little bit. Now what Mason is doing is trying to post Carcanus up down in low and jump over it. Not leave Deion Zian. He'll head to the line. For those just joining us, the Mason shot from midcourt, just inside midcourt, before the half disallowed because the official time is kept on the clocks above the baskets. But there was uh, an admission at halftime that the clocks on the perimeter here of the Carrier Dome are out of sync. And Mason's shot had been launched, if you were looking at the other clocks, with uh, about six tenths of a second. second to go. Explanation being that the long cable line to those other clocks has uh, amounted to a six tenths of a second delay. Oklahoma State appealed. The appeal denied. We'll see Mason looking up. He thinks he's got the time wired. All of a sudden, he releases in what he thinks he's got plenty of time. But the horn sounded just as he was ready to put the shot up. This was the clock that we saw. And again, it was in our frame of view because Mason took the shot right in front of us. That's the clock opposite us. Another good rebound. Seton Hall really making up for their lack of outside shooting tonight with far superior rebounding they're used to. Good backdoor cut. Volcanus again, no. Morton on a rebound. Antonati, is it going to be his fourth? Yes. It's a critical foul. We had fouls became a major factor in the first game tonight for Duke University when Boozer got in trouble. Maldonado, who has had a pretty good second half with a 15-foot jump shot of his, will go down on the bench, and, and Eddie Sutton does not have offensive power to put in his place. Andre Williams will step in for him. Williams had a nice flushing offensive rebound in the first half, but he does not have the shot selection or the ability to make that jumper that Maldonado has. A bump outside on Gottlieb. Seton Hall, the only Big East team still alive in this tournament, while Oklahoma State is attempting to join conference uh, ally, if you will, Iowa State in the Elite Eight. Well, think about Seton Hall, Jim. In the Big East, they beat St. John's, Connecticut, and Syracuse. So they have had wins against outstanding teams. Allen Bear, not his shot. A lot of chances on that trip for the Pirates. We'll keep tabs on that as it progresses. 14 and a half to play in the second half. Oklahoma State by two. Clark, one of the things about this that we've got to call attention to it because we've been watching is the great move to the basket by Kalkina. He has a tremendous first step. He knows how to use his body and take advantage of angles. A key issue in this game, Brian Montanati for Oklahoma State just picked up his fourth foul. He's a weapon offensively inside. Seton Hall's done a nice job on the glass despite being primarily a perimeter team. Okay, you going to show up tomorrow? Um, I plan to. Oh, good. We have a full day scheduled tomorrow. We're out here, and then we'll take you back to Austin, Texas for second half action after this. Pennzoil at the half has been sponsored by Pennzoil, specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Is the national championship game the night before Falcon? <laughs> April the 3rd. Let's not forget about that, People Magazine.
Shine over plays Gottlieb. Nice move on his part. Try to keep the ball away for the primary ball handler. There's only 18 seconds left on the clock. Gottlieb, they're just giving it to him. He's not even thinking about it. Great right inside screening. Weber doing a good job. 11th assist for Gottlieb. And no excuse for that, Jim. You've got, they're not even guarding him, so with five men were guarding four, and he still was able to thread the pass. That ties it at 50. Pautanus. Mason, normally a very good defensive player, but he is playing on a leg and a half right now, because he is still gimpy. Zone defense now by Seton Hall. Trying to stop some of that inside screening that's been so effective. Matching up down the low end. Weber just banging guys around inside. Five on the shot clock. Gottlieb got it in there with the left hand. Back out. Mason three. How about that passing by the Cowboys? And, and look, at he can't even go backwards properly, but yet he has such a squared up jump shot. Just perfect release. Here, Weber, big body in there setting screens. Oh. That's going to be a foul on Mason. Mason. And Kalkanis with a hard fall to the floor, his first. You know, Mason said something that I think, Jim, very interesting. He said the game comes him to him now in slow motion. All great players eventually get to that. Just like this right here. Yes, sir. But he has had a good tournament thus far. Misses both free throws, and Tennessee stays on top by three. One thing about Brendan Haywood, the way the backcourt violation as he tumbles. Shine, huge three, ties it. Lane Hurt down here on the floor, twisted his ankle, or, or is it a knee? He took a hard fall, but he's gonna stay in the game, so we have, he ought to be matched up with Mason, both of them hurting. This was a pretty good offensive play for Seton Hall because it left Shine wide open. Let's see what happens to him here, you can oh, see. Alexander falls yeah, on his knee. Knee and ankle. Oklahoma State's missed its last five shots. Oh, the shot drops and they count it. Atkins. Paul Canis reached in. Atkins had the presence of mind to stay with the shot. Gets it to go. Paul Canis with his third. Atkins went into a very severe slump in January. Seven games. He had 5.9 points a game, was only shooting 28%. In February, he comes back, averages 14.3 a game, and shoots over 40%. Tonight, he's having his problems, just one for six, and that one was a crime. Three-point play. Three-point play against the Cowboys. The three-point edge. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Daytech Online and by Sealy Posturepedic. Only 10 teams are still alive. Florida in the Elite Eight with its upset win over number one Duke earlier tonight here in Syracuse. Tulsa in the Austin final will take on the winner of Carolina, Tennessee with the balls in front in the second half. We'll have a Big Ten team in Indianapolis as Wisconsin and Purdue Conference foes will battle tomorrow. And the one and the two, the Midwest, the only bracket that kind of stayed in form, if you will. They'll meet tomorrow for the Midwest Regional Championship. Norton trying to set a solid screen. Three shine up. Good hands by Weber. Back to Caucanus. Lane. Oh, great block by Mason. Boy, that was a good job. Lane is quick, high off his feet. Mason with that sore leg, and he really is limping on it. Doing a terrific job defensively, showing the kind of vertical leap he has. John Zian, followed up by Mason. Couldn't climb high yeah, enough. Maybe yeah. the bad leg was the reason why. I, I would agree, Jim. I think Shine. he goes way above the bat. That's an air ball. Mason did a good recovery on him. You notice how he's staying in this basketball game, though, even though he's limping severely. 
Oklahoma State, stayed here in upstate New York after going through Buffalo in the first two rounds last week, beating Hofstra and Pepperdine. They did not go home. They went to Niagara Falls last Saturday between games and stayed in Buffalo, went to a Sabres game, Let's see a movie. They'd like to stay at least two more days in upstate New York. Extend the stay with a late checkout, if you will. The CBS Sports Line stat of the game. Assists. Well, this is the Gottlieb category here. 18 for the Cowboys, 11 of them from their point guard. And you can get complete stats after the game at cbs.sportsline.com. And how about the, the fact that not only do they have the 18 assists, Jim, but they're not turning the ball over. We talked about that before the game. Incredible assist turnover ratio. On the year, they came into this game with 603 assists and only 460 turnovers. That's a plus 143. Now you can shoot poorly, and they don't, but you can shoot poorly if you're going to go ahead and be so judicious with the ball. This game was tied, and, and now the Cowboys have gone on the Adkins diet. Five unanswered to give Oklahoma State the 58-53 lead. His first five of the night. And you can see where Holloway is really missed now because Seton Hall's having a hard time getting shots. That time Lane comes through for him. The last basket they got, remember, was on the, the mishandling of the pass. Lane brings it down to a three-point game. 6-20 remaining. And there's the 1-3-1 zone. Morton running the baseline, trying to keep an eye on Mason. Atkins, he's got the hot hand. He'll take it. Followed up and in by Janzian. Strange tip in. Well, Weber helped him by keeping Dallin Bear off the boards there. Weber giving some valuable minutes out here. He won't show up on the stat sheet, but he is doing some banging. Lane took the three. Tipped around, saved by Atkins. Out to Gottlieb. Mason says, hold up, he's on the far side. It's smart play by Mason. He was trying to occupy some clock. The object is to win the game. Excitement every time Weber touches the ball. Oh, that was off. Hit Atkins the leg, foot. didn't it? Yep. Atkins foot. Good hustle by Lane. First turnover in an 11 minute stretch. You see this? Hey, these officials are catching some of these tight calls. There was the little kick right on it. Seton Hall ball when we come back. The Pirates call the timeout with five and a half remaining. Seton Hall, the 10th seed in the East. Tommy Amaker, the coach, just his third year. His first two seasons, they went to the NIT. This is first trip to the NCAA tournament as a head coach after nine years as a Duke assistant. It will not be his last, Jim. You can look at this guy just as we did at Billy Donovan, and you're talking about the giants of the future when you see these two guys. And you no, know they're going to be outstanding. No doubt. And a class act all the way. Four-year starter at Duke. And defensive player of the year back in 87 when he was the starting point guard for the Blue Devils. Montanati is back in the game, Billy, with his four fouls. Well, that was a nice use of time. Give Weber a lot of credit there. As I said, he won't be on the stat sheet very much, but those were valuable minutes. Kept alive by Morton. And then Janzian is over the back. So Morton's tip. Basically helps draw the foul out of the Cowboys center Yan Zian. His second. Just the sixth team foul, so one away from a one on one. Lane again. Well, that would have been a tough shot to make. Oh, Jason. What a block! Zian. And it looked like an uncontested two coming for Caucanus. Well, Canis is going to have to get some shots down the way here, Jim, because we can't count on Lane being the only guy to put something up. And here we see Oklahoma State spreading it out. A little 1-4 type action, using some clock here. Now, what's going to be dangerous is Gottlieb is so good at penetrating in this offense. Atkins inside. Boy, throws up a rope. Well, he thought he could go over Shine at the size. Shine. Off balance, followed up. Gottlieb has it. 
How about how often they put the ball back in his hands? We're talking about a guy who can't shoot the ball, but he runs this game and he keeps his team as a non turnover ball club. Oh, four corner type action right here. Timeout called by Gottlieb. Really, you don't see a player with that kind of weaponry. A really unusual player, Gottlieb. He contributes in a big way. We're talking about Gottlieb as you see the game reset. He grabbed a moment ago his career high seventh rebound of the game for Coach Eddie Sutton, his team 26 and 6. Well, you know, it's interesting about Gottlieb. He was thought he would be recruited and wanted to go to Duke. He was recruited, but they were looking at a guy named Wojciechowski and decided to take him instead of Gottlieb. Gottlieb talked about the possibility of playing against Duke if he could win today, but he probably didn't realize that Florida was going to be the opponent if they're fortunate enough to win. Good backdoor cut. Well, that was read, though, by Morton. He denied the entry. Oh, Pocanis walked. He was shuffling the feet as he tried to handle that pass. There just aren't enough weapons to score on this team right now for Seton Hall. Lane, he's a shooter, short. So what happens is those that can shoot the ball are having to take bad shots. Shine three. Followed up by oh, Lane. One thing about Shine, he's had to go the whole way oh, tonight. Absolutely, and knew it. But has proven he can play multiple minutes in big games. Four out of 15 from the field tonight. Lane, Lane's got a hold of Mason's shirt. And so, so nice move. Not able to finish. Morton, Morton and Harris underneath. Under three to play, three point game. This could tie it. Bounces around, almost gets the, the kick. But you see how the premium gym has put on just a couple of guys to take all the shots. It's so difficult. We don't have any inside presence at all offensively. Seton Hall has put up 31 attempts from three, making only six of them. That's one more than they had. That's a wall. Mason nails it. Eddie Sutton so frustrated. Timeout on the floor, 2.23 to go. Another Seton Hall game coming down to the last minute. Jim Nance and Billy Packer back with you from the Carrier Dome. And uh, Billy, is this, the, is this the kind of game you expected you'd see here in game two? Not really. I didn't think that Seton Hall would be able to stay with, with Oklahoma State in this game at all without Holloway playing because I didn't think that Tommy Emmerker would have anywhere to go on the bench. Uh, but his team has really held in there very nicely. And I think what we're going to see right now is Eddie Sutton trying to milk this clock. Gottlieb, who's had an outstanding game delivering the basketball, as we anticipated, last year's uh, best assist man in the country, and number two this year, has really had an outstanding game as a floor general. Harris inside. And what a block by Janzian. And gets down the court quickly, but Gottlieb knows the role here is to occupy the ball. Harris's first miss of the season at Syracuse is a costly one. What a defensive play by Yanzian. Seton Hall fans wanted a goaltend. Was it even close? Bill? I don't think so. I think the ball was on the way up. Good timing on his part. Eddie Sutton says, we're not going to stall. They go back to their half-court offense. Huntley underneath. Ten on the shot clock. Whenever you play him honest, he has to throw that pass, and Seton Hall did a good job with it. Take a look at it. Jim on the block. Harris goes on the inside. The ball definitely on the way up. Good block. What did Shaheen Holloway think? <laughs> he doesn't agree, but you can see how far away he was, Jim, from being able to play. I mean, he can't even get up on that leg. A senior, the all-time assist man at Seton Hall, Montanati at the line to shoot two. So desperately hoping there's a way. Ooh, as that one bounces out. A way his teammates can come through tonight so that he can, in fact, play at least one more game for the Pirates. One of the things also we talked about the great assist turnover ratio for this team. Oklahoma State shoots 200 more free throws than their opponent. That's over the back Mason. 
And that will be a one and one at the other end. And Eddie Sutton definitely didn't want that because they get an opportunity to put points on the board while the clock is stopped. A big missed opportunity with the two free throws by Montanati. Harris, go, Harris goes to the line only a 46% free throw shooter. So this could be an experience here. He and Gottlieb ought to be in a foul shooting contest somewhere on a playground. <laughs> Freshman from Hollywood, Florida. The team that wins in this one tonight will take on Florida Sunday in the regional final. Oh, you wouldn't know it with that one. Nope. And Jim, just think about something now. How about this strategy if you're Seton Hall? Foul Gottlieb the rest of the game. Put him on the line. See if a 46% free throw shooter can make some. Once you get a chance, if you foul him right now, with it just being a one. Oh, he banks it home. <laughs> now, you don't want to foul here, but I sure would take some chances, the old Jimmy Valdano style. Foul to get the ball back. 126 to go. One point lead, Cowboys. Oklahoma State's gone over five minutes without a field goal. Well, when they put the. Inside and missed the chippy. Huge rebound coming up here for somebody. And the Pirates, Caucanus has it. They say a tie up. Arrow, Oklahoma State. They had three men did Seton Hall on that rebound opportunity and couldn't pull it down. The never say die Seton Hall Pirates are within one. They were down five just a moment ago. 109 to go. They made a great defensive stand. Loose ball, tie up situation. Cowboys had the arrow, so they will inbound it here with a new 35. Into Montanati in a three point lead. Next time down the floor, I think it's time to foul Godley. I'd make him go on that line and see if he can make it. Under a minute. This is when Shine shown in the second round went over Temple. Well, three times this year he's made a game-winning shot. Lane, oh, he got caught, and the ball is picked off by Montanati. See, they, they aren't going to let the ball get in Gottlieb's hands. They're going to put it in Atkins' hands. They, Seton Hall may have lost their opportunity to follow the guy. It's a good move by, you see where Gottlieb is? He's over here. He's not going to touch the ball. Very smart move by Eddie Sutton. Seton Hall lost the opportunity to foul the man you want to put on the line. Shine was trying to foul him away from the ball. Well, then you got an intentional, Jim, and he gets to the line for two and the ball back, so that doesn't help you. That so, was a very smart move by Eddie Sutton. And one possession away for Tommy Emmerker to pull the strategy that might have worked for him. On the last possession, some of you just joined us, but before the tie-up situation, Gottlieb had the ball, and there were opportunities yep. with a one-point game to put him on the line with a one-and-one. One. Now, this is Adkins at the line. I'm surprised that Eddie Sutton doesn't take Gottlieb out of the game right now and put Alexander in there. One-and-one one for Adkins. He's three for three tonight. Now four for four with that one. Well, you're talking about the difference between Atkins handling the ball at 82% free throw shooter and Gottlieb handling the ball at a 44% free throw shooter. So one possession too late for Seton Hall. Five point game. Timeout, Oklahoma State. The last time they went to the Final Four, they went through the East. Again, the Cowboys rode through the East back in 1995. In big country, Bryant Reeves on the way to the Final Four in Seattle. And the King Dome, which will be no longer as of this Sunday. Imploded on Sunday, and this may implode on Seton Hall right here. The 95 Final Four where UCLA raised the roof and won the national championship. I can remember 79 with Eddie Sutton. They've got to go for the three or the two, but they've got to go for either one quickly here. Shine driving on Gottlieb underneath, gives it up Morton down to three, and a timeout with 17 seconds. Now, Eddie got, let, let us see if Eddie Sutton will take Gottlieb out of the game here. Timeout on the floor, called by the Pirates. 
Seton Hall ball, and the Pirates have the arrow. What are they, nothing to beg your pardon, Ohio, uh, Oklahoma State has the ball. What's the strategy here, going? Well, the strategy, Eddie Sutton's all over it. I mean, this guy's a brilliant coach. He takes Scott Leap out of the game now, knowing that Seton Hall would go right after Scott Leap to try to foul him. They bring Alexander into the game, so now they've got all good free throw shooters that'll touch the ball. Seton Hall's got the foul as quickly as possible. And then be thinking three. It will be a double bonus when they put the Cowboys on the line. And it'll be Alexander shooting the two. Young man from the Dallas area, his father, a high school coach, Carrollton, Texas, began his career at Arkansas playing for Nolan Richardson, transferred out. Jim, I think of regional games, and one of the greatest regional games I ever saw Eddie Sutton coached in. Larry Bird, 1979, a guy named Sidney Moncrief, who Eddie coached against this year, Sidney's now a college coach. I'll never forget that. Bobby Heaton hits the shot. Larry Bird so patiently was able to do what he had to do. But Sidney Moncrief went head to head in the closing minutes against Larry Bird, one of the great confrontations I've ever seen in college basketball. I remember that game like it was uh, just a few years ago. Got leaps back now. Again, they take him out so they don't have to worry about him heading to the line as a 44% free throw shooter. Back to a five point margin, 16 seconds remaining. Well, I'll go back to that possession where Gottlieb did have the ball in his hands. The Seton Hall could have tried to go for it. Falling. Lane gets the rebound, and it's down to three. Seven seconds to go, Got and the time. Pirates have called their last time out. Hey. Alexander coming back in the game. Gottlieb will go out. Oklahoma State ball, 7.6 seconds remaining, three-point lead. Alexander back in the ball game, so uh, you find Oklahoma State with all good free throw shooters on the court. So really right now, Jim, I think that Seton Hall has got to go for the steal. They're three down, there's not going to be enough time. This ball gets inbounds to count on foul and getting it back. There is the foul before the ball is even put in play. So 7-6 stays on the clock, but a good free throw shooter goes to the line. He got just hit two. Yep. Alexander. I I'll tell you, if I were Oklahoma State, I'd be a little concerned about Mason's leg. That thing seems to be stiffening up on him, and he is really limping on the floor. Of course, he has a day to rest. Tennessee with seven minutes to go. Leads by six over the Tar Heels. Huge free throws here because this game could be sealed with one of them. There it is. Survive and advance. The story of what the NCAA tournament is all about. Got one of two. Almost picked off. Caucanus with a three. Banks at home, 1.8 seconds. They have no timeouts. Ball inbound, and Alexander fouled with five-tenths of a second to go. Well, Seton Hall gave their faithful all you could ever ask. Valkanis calling his team together. He hits the jumper and used it all here, Jim. Used the backboard well, and they fouled immediately. But as you say, no timeouts left. Hey, what the clock stops though before the ball is inbounded and it took 1.3 seconds before they can stop the official clock here which seems like a, a little more than it should have been so only five tenths of a second to go that Seton Hall would be better served here if he makes the second yeah it, because then they could at least get a throw down the court timeout called by Tommy Amaker and I'm sure that's not lost on the Pirates coach we'll be right back two-point lead and that, again that timeout was called by Oklahoma State and uh, what do you think Eddie Sutton said in there Billy well, a wild strategy would be to say to Alexander try to hit it off the front of the rim and let the ball bounce around a little bit in this five tenths of a second go off because if he makes it Seton Hall will have a clear throw down the other end for a potential three you like make or miss here it's well he tried to make it perfect thing for uh, Oklahoma State was he tried to make it but it was the perfect strategy there's no chance in five tenths of a second to make something happen Cowboys advance to the elite eight and will meet Florida on Sunday Seton Hall makes 
a graceful exit here. Three games in the tournament decided by a grand total of five points. A one point win in overtime, a two point win in overtime, and a two point loss tonight to Oklahoma State. The Chevrolet most valuable players of the game are Darius Lane from Seton Hall and Doug Gottlieb from Oklahoma State. And Chevrolet makes a contribution to each school's general scholarship fund to reward outstanding students for their academic achievements and to assist those in financial need. I'll tell you one thing that says it all about this one tonight. Oklahoma State never led by more than five, but you felt they were in control of the game. I had the upper edge most of the way. Well, Eddie Sutton didn't. He came over here just shaking his head. He's just thankful to advance. Gottlieb helps direct the band. And they'll be back on Sunday. Oklahoma State and Florida, the winners tonight in Syracuse. Let's go down to New York and Greg Gumbel. All right, Jim, so a not-so-sweet 16 for the Big East. Syracuse, Miami, Seton Hall all lose. Let's send you over to Austin, Texas, where North Carolina and Tennessee are in a timeout. 5.37 to play. Dick Enberg and James Worthy are there. While they're in a the timeout, Clark, let's talk about what North Carolina has to do to get back in against the Volunteers. Well, again, they've had some success going inside with Brendan Haywood and Chris Lang. And that's what they're going to have to continue to try to do. But again, I mentioned this throughout the time we've talked about this game. Tennessee's overall team speed has been a problem, and they've also been getting to the free throw line. All right, Clark, they're ready to come out of a timeout in Austin. Let's take you now to Dick and James. Well, the Southeastern Conference has a representative in the Elite Eight, Florida. Tennessee trying to be the second. North Carolina is representing the Atlantic Coast Conference with Duke being knocked out, the number one seed, Oklahoma has two teams through Iowa State and Oklahoma State. Here's your game summary of this second game in Austin Texas with the free throws plus 13 to Tennessee. They've shot uh, two more from outside the line and uh, have out rebounded the Tar Heels by eight and yet it's only a five point game in North Carolina with a ball and the shocker is the fact that Tennessee has out rebounded. North Carolina, but just as the first game with Tulsa, the more athletic team that moves a lot, they're in position to get some boards. Carolina not getting to the free throw line. Lang inside, not close. He's got to be stronger than that with the basketball. The little flip push jumpers aren't enough. You got to drop step and power move. Ron Slay, the freshman with the ball now, again has been the inspiration of this Tennessee team, rallying them from a deficit in the first half. Victor, Tony Harris, he's been quiet, although the leading scorer for the balls on the season. Well, they're going to find Slay. They'll pass that ball around a little bit, then they'll find a cutter, a back door. Oh, a prior that doesn't fall, and back comes Tennessee with the ball after Higgins miss and a foul. Back to the line go the Vols and they're getting two shots on each Carolina foul and for Coda that would be his fourth. And as a player you start to read the body language you look at Tennessee and they're all active in the game you look at Tennessee's bench they're pretty active. Look at the Carolina players they're tired. A little fatigue is setting in and then you look at that North Carolina bench everyone over there is a little bit concerned right now because they don't feel the momentum that they felt in the first half when they were playing well. Yarbrough adds to that mounting total of free throws for Tennessee. He's three for three, has a dozen points in the game. Lang out, and the muscular Peppers replaces him. Well, they need to create some shots. And Max Owens, a creator, he can forte capable. He's putting in guys now that are quicker and can create off the dribble because Carolina needs some attempts at the basket. 21 for 24 from the free throw line for the Tennessee Volunteers, and they're back up by seven. Tennessee in a man to man. North Carolina must start to take off the dribble. Coda's, Coda's the player that can do that. Harris shuts him off. Forte kicks the three. A big one for the freshman star for Carolina. He has 20 to lead all scores. Back to a four point game, and Tennessee brings it in with four and change remaining. Carolina goes to their number one defense, which is the zone, but you got to watch out for Yarbrough running the baseline. Also, Slay inside. 
Loves to pop inside for his little eight footer. Under four minutes to play. Yarbrough. And it's taken away. The defensive peppers force the air. And Jason Cable came up with a loose ball. Carolina down by four. Got to find Forte. He's the guy. Got to find him. Cable inside over Slay. Scores. It's 64 62, Tennessee. Coach Gutch is really excited with the defense. And timeout. Tennessee and the Carolina fans are on their feet. Capel, a tough two inside to pull North Carolina to within a basket. For 62 Tennessee, their nine point lead melts to two. The CBS Sportsline stand of the game, free throws. Tennessee outscoring North Carolina by 15 at the line. For complete game stats, go to cbs.sportsline.com. Bill Guthridge, North Carolina 0 and 11 this season when opponents attempt more free throws, and they're certainly uh, that's going to be the case in the game tonight. Very important now for North Carolina to match the athleticism of Slay, and he traveled trying to make his move toward the baseline. Carolina gets the ball. Tennessee's lead is two. Well, three minutes and 18 seconds left in this second half. North Carolina's pulled within two. Tennessee with victory in its grasp, and suddenly the Tar Heels have turned it around. Well, they lost their big gun inside, so now they know they have to depend on some other people. Capel stepping up, Forte, Peppers playing some good defense. Tennessee will have to continue to attack if they want to contain and keep this lead. North Carolina with seven more field goals than Tennessee, but the Volunteers with their inside game drawing fouls. If they win it, it'll be their free throw shooting. A chance to tie. Coda, the all time assist leader in North Carolina history, with the ball. That's the assist they want, the two pointer, and Coda ties it at 64. Less than three to go. Tony Harris of Tennessee has quick feet. He can stay in front of you, but Coda and Forte have the ability to shoot over Harris once they get inside that lane. Jerry Green shouts the play out to Harris. Harris circles underneath. Outside Black. Higgins has got a good three-point shot. Harris draws Forte. Black and the muscular peppers. Seven on the clock. Higgins to Harris with five. Harris drives. Can't hit it. The battle and out of bounds off Ed Coda. And well, a new clock. Well, that's what the Tar Heroes are complaining about is that the shot clock ran out while the ball was loose there. And they're, they're saying that it didn't hit the rim at all. I don't think it did. It didn't hit the rim, and the, and the ball was still in play when the shot clock was at zero. The ball did go out on North Carolina, and the referees are going to have to get together. Here it is with about three play. seconds left. There's the shot. Yeah, I don't and, see it. Uh, and there's the loose ball. Well, we don't see the clock yet, but there's the air ball. Now, the shot clock is at about three right there. Two. You can see it uh, does not touch the rim. One, and, and then it runs out before it goes out of bounds. Now, that should be North Carolina's ball on the shot clock violation. Uh, if they're able to see it as we did. And they can. This is a correctable error, and they can check it out on the video replay this is similar to the UCLA Stanford game at the end of the season in overtime and it's such a it's such an important game that they have to get this play right now there's the shot clock at two still in play now it does go out on the Carolina player now right there it's at zero and it hadn't gone out of bounds yet let's see now right there they said it may have hit the rim no, but no angle, it no. did not it shook the nets a little bit so that's the question and they aren't looking at a monitor what they're doing is they're having a discussion with both coaches. It was the long range shot that showed it best that the ball wound up being short of the basket from some angles it looks as if it might have clipped the iron and even in that going back to that UCLA Stanford game which they corrected at games end, it just did nick the iron. Now here's the shot that I believe reveals the fact the ball comes up short touches the net but not the rim. And they changed the call. North Carolina ball. 224 left 
64-64. North Carolina on a 9-2 run in the last three and a half minutes. And North Carolina has a small lineup now. They should be able to combat the pressure of Tennessee. They have some ball handlers capable if they could just spread it out and let someone bring it up the floor. Watch out for Slay though. He's got some tricky hands. Capel 6'8, so is Slay. So here's the player I think has the best scoring opportunities with his penetration and his little push jump shots in the paint. Coda scores! The veteran from Brooklyn has given North Carolina the lead 66-64, less than two to go. He wants to play again, and he does not want it to be intramural softball when he gets back to campus. He wants to come back and play on Sunday, and he's showing the aggressiveness from the point guard position, which he had to do for North Carolina. Tulsa awaits the winner in the Elite Eight Sunday. One and a half minutes left. They have to get it to Slay. He's the shot maker. Harris for three. Not there. Peppers up high for the rebound. The defensive end in football for North Carolina. Coda with the ball. 120 to go. It's Ed Coda's show from here on out. He's going to dictate what he wants to or either get it to Forte. 20 seconds on the shot clock. 110 on the game clock. Got to get it to Coda if you can. Cable sees the opening. Peppers backs off with 10. Forte with seven. We're in the final minute. Oh, he's going up. He's going up for the three. And he can't hit it. Peppers does it. Oh, it does. No, no, no basket. It's ruled a shot violation. Peppers didn't get it off in time. And that could be a critical call. My, oh, my, was that close. Watch the clock. Oh. Two seconds. Peppers. Oh, that's good. The basket should have been allowed. That's good. It was out of his hand before the seconds ticked to zero. Tough break for North Carolina. One second. Is it out of his? Well, you can't see the clock. Should have been good. The difference between a two and a four point lead and a hair of a second. Watch again. Three seconds and Peppers with two, with one out of his hand. And there's still a second on the clock. Yeah, clearly that should have been good, although when it's in uh, full speed and you're the official with the whistle, you got to make the call. In this case, it cost Carolina two points they had earned. What presence of mind of Peppers to know that he had to get that ball out of his hands. Here's Slay trying to tie it. Misses the shot. Rebound Forte, and he's pulled down by Slay. And that seemed to be a little too much. Forte not at all happy as he comes up limping as Slay took him down. They were looking for the flagrant foul. Bill Guthridge battling on the bench. This veteran coach who sat next to the legendary Dean Smith for so many years since his days in Kansas lost his mother two days ago. Ninety six year old mother passed away has a funeral on Monday. They said he was so emotional after his team beat number one seed Stanford that he broke into tears in the locker room in Birmingham Alabama battling against criticism all season long because his team lost more games than any North Carolina team in a half century. But he's got his team battling and this is the other side of Bill Guthridge as Forte with two shots. Big free throws down the stretch and Coach Guthridge he knows he can coach. I played under Coach Guthridge. He's a very knowledgeable basketball coach had some injuries had a slow start maybe over scheduled a little bit. But make no mistakes. Four seconds to coach with his 21st and 22nd points to give North Carolina a four point lead. I don't want y'all throw on the three. He's going to be looking for it as soon as he touches it. Slay for three. Rattles out. Pippers pulls down the rebound and Higgins with a reach in foul. A remarkable comeback in the final five minutes by North Carolina. They have shut out Tennessee. The last six minutes and 45 seconds, the volunteers have not made a field goal. And that's with this man, the seven footer, Brendan Haywood, on the bench. And in a way, without their seven footer, Carolina has played tougher and more effective basketball. Well, Coach Gutchers has found something new here in the last two minutes, particularly with Haywood out of the game, and that's a lineup that works with the small players. They don't have Chris Lang in the ball game. Julius Peppers, the walk-on football player, I cannot tell you 
What addition he has made. Ed Coda doing what he's supposed to do, and that's be a little bit more aggressive in scoring. Peppers knocks down the first of two. Peppers hits the free throw. It's a five point game. Bill Guthridge, his team was picked to win the ACC. They were ranked in the uh, top three in the preseason polls. They finished nine and seven in the conference, won only 18 games, 13 losses, and Carolina fans aren't used to that. And he's had to take a lot of heat. They were calling for his job throughout the country, but his team has rallied in his behalf. They are 26 seconds from the Elite Eight. Back at the Irwin Center, University of Texas in Austin, North Carolina, two timeouts, Tennessee won, both at the 10 fall mark. Tennessee with just under 13 minutes left in the second half, led by nine, 51-42. And then late in the game, just as Stanford went into a drought in the round two in Birmingham, so has it been for Tennessee. They've not scored a point in four minutes and 48 seconds, the Volunteers. Way outside is Higgins. He misses the three. And uh, Capel running into his own man, Forte, travels, and Tennessee will get it back with 16 seconds left. Well, if North Carolina does not give up any quick threes and turn it over, they've done themselves a big favor. 6.45 without a field goal and five minutes without a point. Way downtown is Harris, and he hits the three, and that takes Tennessee within another three of a tie, and they've got 13 seconds. You can't chalk up a Tar Heel victory yet. No way. Tony Harris drilling one from 30 feet. And the drought has ended for Tennessee. They pull within three. Here's the situation. Carolina has the timeouts. Tennessee none. Any foul will send the opponent to the line for two. It's 70 to 67. Tulsa with an 80 71 win over the University of Miami is already qualified. They represent the big whack there in the Elite Eight. Duke knocked off earlier by. Florida and so the ACC banner being carried by the Tar Heels of North Carolina certainly underdogs coming into this tournament as the number eight seed big victories against Missouri where many thought Missouri would beat them then the number one seed Stanford a big win for North Carolina and Birmingham and down by nine they've rallied here and with just eleven and a half seconds left Bill Guthridge's team sends Coda to the line he needs to make one of the two to force a double uh, possession for Tennessee. Looking for his 10th point. He's made some crucial plays in this final five minutes. Ooh, there it is, the four point lead, 71 67. That one beat the drum a little bit. Got all the rim. He used every inch of the rim there. Seventy two sixty seven and a disheartened Tony Harris just flips the ball back. He'll hurry and he'll fire. No four point plays. Short followed in by C.J. Black. There's no timeouts left and the long pass to Max Owens frosting for North Carolina. One point six seconds left and North Carolina moves on to the final eight. And a remarkable comeback here in Austin, Texas, down by nine. Bill Guthridge's Tar Heels without their seven foot starting center in the final eight minutes. They find a way, led by the senior Ed Coda and the freshman Joseph Forte. They defeat the University of Tennessee 74 69. The Chevrolet most valuable players of this game Joseph Forte the ACC freshman of the year 22 for Carolina CJ Black the senior power man inside with 15 for Jerry Green's volunteers for James Worthy and Spencer Tillman. This is Dick Edberg. A look at the bracket on Sunday. It'll be Carolina and Tulsa with a right to go to Indianapolis. Greg Gumbel and Clark Kellogg will get you caught up on all the tournament news right after these messages. So long from Austin, Texas. Greg Gumbel and Clark Kellogg back in New York. We remind you, coming up next year on CBS, your late local news, followed by the late show with David Letterman and Dave's guests. 
Denzel Washington and Joe Torrey. Let's recap what's happened for you this evening. In Austin, Texas, North Carolina rallies to beat Tennessee 74 to 69. They move on because the other winner in Austin was Tulsa. The Golden Hurricane defeated the Miami Hurricanes 80 to 71. It sets up the final in the South region between North Carolina and Tulsa. Meanwhile, in the East at Syracuse, Seton Hall fell short. Oklahoma State a winner by a score of 68 to 66. In the other matchup in Syracuse tonight, the Florida Gators knocked off the top seed of the East, Duke, 87 to 78. That makes the East region on Sunday look like this. It'll be Florida, the number five seed, against third seed, Oklahoma State. We remind you that we come your way tomorrow at noon Eastern time with the road to the Final Four. Following that, at 1.30, the Men's Division II Championship between Kentucky Wesleyan and Metro State. We'll be back with the road to the Final Four at 4 o'clock. And then the first of our two regional finals, Wisconsin against Purdue from Albuquerque at about 4.40 Eastern time. Then at 7 p.m., the Midwest final from Auburn Hills between Michigan State and Iowa State. Sounds like a full day to me tomorrow. It really is going to be a full day. That Wisconsin-Purdue matchup, a thump and bump kind of type of game. Iowa State, Michigan State, both teams very good in the open court and better defensively than I think people give them credit for being. Last time there was only one number one seed in the Elite Eight back in 1980. That was LSU. It's Michigan State, and Michigan State will try to hold forth as they go into action tomorrow. We thank you for joining us tonight. For Clark Kellogg and for all of us here at CBS Sports, I'm Greg Gumbel. We'll see you at noon tomorrow here on CBS. Say goodbye.